Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Thought provoking. Informative. Engaging. Are you ready to be inspired and equipped? And now, The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Hi, uh, welcome to The Comfort Zone. I'm Ray Comfort with Frank Sontag uh, from KKLA, the most prestigious, most popular, largest Christian radio station in Southern California. As <laughs> hard as it is to believe, that is true, yes. He's six foot four, and that's why he's seated. You can't see it, but I'm actually standing on my seat. Uh, and we've got the Tabubili loving Arab helping American and Arab relationships. Easy in the other studio. Let's cross over to the other studio. How you doing, Easy? Hello, how are you? Good to be with you again. <laughs> like always. Like always. What a joy to have you with us, Frank. You know, it's a delight for me, uh, having had the privilege to go on air with you. Uh, you had me as a guest on, you had Ray as well. And then you came to our church and spoke. And uh, boy, uh, how moving that was. And so we're just so blessed to have you with us today. Thanks for making the time and coming down. Oh, I'm so honored, grateful to be here. You don't look over the other studio. <laughs> just miles away, okay? <laughs> uh, look at that thing there. So have you been in an earthquake? You're, you're in Los Angeles. You've yes. been in a, a, a broadcasting live during an earthquake. Uh, I was at another station for 27 years, a mm -hmm. uh, music station across town, and I used to do an early morning and late night talk show. Uh -huh. And the last two big earthquakes, I was in the chair for both of them. And you stayed in the chair. I that's stayed a, in the that's chair. That's a real trooper. The, the old joke in L.A., people listening back, there was a newscaster who will go unnamed because he <laughs> still probably gets razzed. Oh, Kent, yeah. 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 <laughs> Kent, what's his last name? Yeah. And uh, earthquake happened, live TV, and he went under... <laughs> The, the uh, <laughs> council, and so in radio, we, uh, we didn't do that. You stay on top. Yeah. So what's your show about? How would you describe it in one sentence or two, three? Well, we try to take modern day and uh, topics and share from a Christian perspective. Yeah. And I have uh, uh, an audience that is both uh, Christian and a lot of non-believers. Uh-huh. Because they're, uh, they've, they've followed me from my so old days at uh, the other stage. You take live calls. Live calls, interviews, and, uh, and guests. So is it sure. scary taking live calls? We'd like to do it here, but so many atheists watch our show, we don't know how we'd handle their live calls. I did uh, talk radio for 21 years. Uh -huh. I love taking calls. You it's do? actually, I love that more than Do you have interviews. a delay? I a would five second delay? Yeah, I would imagine there is. I don't know, KKLA, I don't know what theirs is, but at the other place we had a delay for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to nowadays. Yeah. So Frank, yeah, uh, you, mentioned being in, you mentioned being in radio for a long time. How'd you get into it all? I mean, was it something that you'd pursued from a young age or you just kind of found yourself in it somehow? Oh boy, June 17th of 1984, I was in a very serious motorcycle crash and as I was rehabilitating, I was laying there thinking, what do I want to do? And radio is something I always love to do. And so uh, I moved away to Lake Tahoe and kind of locked myself in a cabin for a while trying to figure out what happened. Hmm. And when I so came back... So what happened? Uh, well, I was uh, minding my own business, uh, San Fernando Valley on my motorcycle, and a uh, man didn't see me. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, driving in excess of triple digits, and on oh. impact after braking, CHP said it was 110 when he hit me. Whoa. And I had, uh, I had someone on the back of the bike who survived, but uh, it was not fun for a while. Do you still ride a bike? I did for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a five-year-old now, and my wife has said no more motorcycles. Yeah, it's so. pretty dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah especially in this town. They don't see you most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Um, so how did you come to faith in Christ? Wow. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I was at, uh, yeah, I'm looking up there. <laughs> <laughs> thinking I'm going to say this. In December of uh, a handful of years ago, my best friend had come to Christ previous mm -hmm. and didn't proselytize. He knew I was a non-believer. Mm -hmm. I was a uh, New Age guy that taught New Age principles for 20-some years. Did you years. think you were God? I tried to be God, Ray. <laughs> I, I tried to self-actualize. Uh, it's true. Right. It's I was really hard so to lost. think of God when you wake up first thing in the morning. It doesn't yes. feel like it, does no, it? No, no. But you keep blind yourself because you love your sin. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I did that for so long. And when you're in, thousands, in front of thousands of people and they uh, look at you like you're just amazing, when you don't know the Lord, it's easy to go there. Yeah. So... 
I taught New Age for a lot of years, and then my best friend had given his life to Christ, and I saw a change in him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. And then his brother was a Christian pastor. And uh, we had this event a handful of years ago, a December event. We played golf in Fullerton, not too far from your studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, we quit after nine. And nine holes? Nine holes. I think it's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's a short game. One quick game. And we went to lunch. And his brother, Pastor Dale, leaned in on me. He says, you have a year and a half old son at home. I don't want to preach to you because you've got it all figured out. I was kind of a Buddhist, mm -hmm. if you will. Wow. He said, would you meditate on if you don't make it home? Are you right wow. with God? And I said, absolutely, without yeah. hesitating at all. And he said, would you meditate on that before you drive your car home? I said, sure. So we spent some time together, and um, I got in my car, went to start the ignition. Oh, yeah, I told Pastor Dale I would meditate on it. And uh, I sat in my car, and I started to become very warm. And um, I heard as clear as both of your voices, are you ready to submit to me? Mm. I knew who it was. Uh, contrary to many people that come to faith, my life was, I had a wife, a great job, a brand new house, a son, it wasn't like I was on, in right. dire straits. Mm. But I said yes. Mm. And then he told me something that the context of in my spiritual life, I read the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Upanishads, I wouldn't open a Bible though. Mm. Wow. And uh, he told me, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Mm. And I had no reference to biblical scripture. Um, come some time went by, I called my buddies after I was done, and I told them, I said, I think I want to go back to church, which I had said I would never go back to church 35 years previous to that. Wow. So when I said that, I knew something profound had happened. Pastor Dale said, I'm going to mail you a Bible. I went home and shared with my wife. Uh, she wasn't happy. She had met me at a New Age lecture uh, that I used to facilitate. And uh, about 10 days went by. One night I got up reading the Bible, came across Luke 9, 23, mm -hmm. which in essence says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I got on my knees and I said, Lord, don't know what this means, what's happening in my life, but from here on, I am all yours. Wow. Wow. So, <clears throat> did your friends, were they happy about that? Oh, <laughs> they keep thrilled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Frank, I was going to ask, you know, we'll leave it unnamed, but you were on a very popular radio program out here that was somewhat vulgar and extreme, uh, you know. Somewhat, and, and you're being kind. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm trying to be nice. Very much in the world. It was a very, yeah, it was a very worldly and uh, decadent program. So how did, how did that shake up your world? How'd they respond to that? And, and where did you go from there? Yeah, it was a little rough. Um, I had been on that show for at least 10 years and loved it, rock and roll people, you know, money, the, the world, all of the things I've been comfortable with. And when the Lord asks you, are you ready, and you say yes, obviously your heart's regenerated instantly, but you're still in the flesh, and sanctification was really rocky. Mm. I wanted off that show instantly right. after that happened. <laughs> and they, uh, at first they were a little crass, like they did on the air a lot, made mm. fun, playfully, but uh, it was very demeaning. Uh, they said a lot of things that well, weren't so kind. But then after a while, it was interesting because they kind of saw the change in me, mm. and they uh, tempered their comments a bit. And uh, I was on the show for a handful of years after that and would pray every morning, Lord, get me off the show. <laughs> but um, oh. I stopped actually commenting a whole lot. And uh, I got quiet, and whenever I had an opportunity, I would uh, obviously share about, uh, about my new faith. Wow. So, what a dilemma. I mean, I figured that uh, once they knew you were a Christian, you'd be gone, but it actually came to air, and they, so they talked about you being a believer on the air and mocked you? Yeah, one of the things that I did for years, I was uh, uh, into thoroughbreds, and I had a racehorse, and they would uh, you know, gambler and the whole thing, and I gambled many years ago, but I stopped. But during the time I was on the show with them and my horse, they would, uh, Frank doesn't gamble anymore, and... He's just, he doesn't go out and play with us anymore, and Frank's a Christian now, and <laughs> would, uh, would mock me. Yeah. Right. And I would say, yeah, praise God, yes I am. And uh, the last day of the show, when they retired and uh, were let go, everybody was uh, let go after the show, the last thing I said on the air, when I had an opportunity for a closing comment, 
room was filled with tears, a lot of people upset about these guys going off the air. And uh, as the expression goes, I said, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds my future, yeah. mm, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I got to share with everybody listening uh, my faith, and wow. uh, they had the highest rated send-off. So uh, scores of people got to hear me give, uh, give him all the praise that he deserves. So you've interviewed a lot of people. Do you have any really memorable interviews? Memorable interviews. Yeah, anything interesting happened or has it just been boring? I have interviewed a lot of people, <laughs> uh, a lot of celebrities, but uh, you use the word memorable. Mm. A handful of weeks ago, I interviewed Cy Robertson from Duck Dynasty. Oh, oh that'd be memorable. Yeah. You know the show? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. what was memorable was we were talking and I asked him, do you love ducks? <laughs> and he said... For five minutes, he gave me a dissertation on three ways to cook ducks. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, at first I was a little uneasy, but I realized he, he just, that's him. And the show's popular, so we've had more response from that interview than uh, a lot of the interviews that I've done over the last six months. Do you, do you have a kill Thank switch? Uh, a cough button? Yes. You do? Yes. Yeah, and you use it much? Never used it up until now. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no, oh, haven't. that's really funny. For those who don't know, a cough button is when you want to cough on a live radio program, you just go, it kills the microphone, and yep. you go, <laughs> i got to share something happened many years ago. A guy named Dudley Scantlebury interviewed me. This is when I was a brand-new Christian. What's his name again? Dudley Scantlebury. Okay. <laughs> and his voice sounded like his name. Very cultured English accent. Everything was pronunciated correctly. And uh, he had terrible sinus problems, and he, he could hardly breathe he could sometimes, and he couldn't taste his food. It was that serious, but it kind of mellowed his voice somewhat, made it sound a little more interesting. I was doing a live program with him once, and remember the kill switch and his sinuses. He began the interview with, uh, Ray Comfort, it's great to have you on the <laughs> program. <laughs> And I lost it. After the interview, my wife says, what was that grunting I heard after he asked that question? It was because I fell off my stool onto the floor. I was choking so much. Uh, but uh, oh, that was boy. very memorable for me. That is funny. Yeah. You know, Frank, uh, Ray mentioned that we have a lot of atheists that watch the program and agnostics and other people of different persuasions. Before you came to Christ, were there any questions that you struggled with in your mind? Uh, you know, life questions or maybe questions about Christianity or what have you that, that uh, you ended up seeking out the answers for and that maybe make more sense to you now? I think mean, that'd oh, be helpful with our Without viewers. a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, when I had this event happen and I started to ponder where did life go from there, uh, I decided to start reading, and, and Mere Christianity was probably the trigger point. Mm. And as C.S. Lewis puts uh, liar, lord, lunatic, or lord, I started asking myself, because I was raised in faith as a child, another branch of Christianity, I'll mm. say, and when I walked away in high school and said I had had it, I thought mm. I knew who Christ was. Right. But for some reason, I started to really have a sense of wanting to ask myself, do I really know who he is? And so when I started reading, uh, I read three books, Lee Strobel's um, Case, for Christ. Case for Christ, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell, mm -hmm. and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And I started to examine about Christ. I started to realize that I framed him as a nice spiritual teacher for a lot of years. Mm. When I was a New Ager, that's kind of how he fit in my nice, comfortable box. Right. And so when I came to the place of undeniably recognizing that he was who he says he was this and is the son of god um that was probably the entry point in the fulcrum that kind of pushed me forward in my new uh, new faith i also sent out i had a website from my old talk show i sent out a blast announcement that i had uh, come to christ oh you did and uh let's just say the email started and uh not a lot of happy people. So you sound like a bit of a fighter. You enjoy fighting. I don't know about enjoy, but I think confrontation, we're, we're called to love, yeah. Matthew 22, 36, 39. We're called to love, and, and I, I look at our Lord. He wasn't uh, uh, someone that ducked away. I love the clearing of the temple. Absolutely. It's just, yeah, get that whip <laughs> out. <laughs> Absolutely. And I dropped out of college twice, terrified to take a speech class mm -hmm. wow. and he's got me he put me in 
I really believe the Lord put me in radio even when I didn't know him. But in terms of confrontation, absolutely. We have a situation in our, in our world right now where the world thinks one way, and we're paying the price as Christians, and I'm surely not going to turn my back and walk away. So loving confrontation, I'd like to think of. Well, I identify with you. When I was in school as a little kid, uh, I was called uh, Red Indian because I'd, I'd blush at the drop of a hat. Even without a hat dropping, I'd blush. Where did that come from, a drop of a hat? <laughs> a stupid saying. It drives me out the wall. I feel down in the mouth about it. Pay through the nose at the restaurant. That's a ridiculous saying, pan through the nose. Can't get the Where's the kill the switch? <laughs> yeah, so where's it, where where's exactly, that where's it now? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was in school too, and I had to make a speech, and I made a speech to my peers about surfing, something I just absolutely loved. And I, I just couldn't. I, st I, I humiliated myself. Mine went blank, sat down. I thought, I'll never ever speak in public yeah. again. And God hears you say things like that. And he says, that's the person I want to use. Because yeah. they got nothing. And they got no talent, they got anything. They, they, they're like Moses who said, I can't speak. And, and Jeremiah, I can't speak. And mm -hmm. uh, everyone says, I can't speak. Uh, uh, Gideon and, and, uh, and Paul. But they're the ones that God uses. So I really identify with that. Well, yeah. when I fell into radio after my motorcycle crash. You fell into radio? As a matter of speaking. Yes. It's a play on words. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I had never been in a radio studio in my life, and I got an internship, and I walked in, and I thought to myself, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I had been in the movie industry for a while. I did a lot of different things. And so um, two years later, I found myself behind a microphone hosting my own show, and I remember just as I was about to go on the air, oh, yeah, that's right. I dropped out of college because I wouldn't take a speech <laughs> class. <laughs> and I had a sense of God, if you will, but that was kind of the coexist God, the truth in all religions God. Uh, mm -hmm. But I had a sense that maybe God wanted me behind that microphone, and I was terrified. Wow. And I uh, probably don't need to ask this, but you enjoy it? That's, uh, I, I, you know, I want to say I love it, but I will also say there isn't a show right before I go on the air where I'm thinking, oh boy, this is... Uh, what am I going to say? Yeah, <laughs> I might have. Since I've taken my new job over at KKLA, there's been many times where I pray two minutes before air, Lord, use me. I'm yeah, well, not even I, sure what I'm, I'm going to... have to quote Psalm 119. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, so where can people hear you on the internet? Can they just go to kkla.com yes. and hear you? And Is there archives of, of you where they can hear you live each day? All the shows are podcast, uh, and also we stream live 24-7. So yeah, they can... They can listen online if they're not in the Southern California area. Very cool. You know, Frank, you said something that uh, I know an unbeliever can't relate to, because Scripture says that, uh, you know, the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. But you said after you came to Christ, you couldn't wait to, to get off the air. Uh, on a program that was extremely popular, where you had access to really famous and wealthy and well-known people, and, I mean, you could have lived the, the rock style lifestyle uh, in a manner of speaking. But I, I so relate to what you said. Before I came to Christ, I was a rap artist, uh, believe it or not. And people I went <laughs> people went crazy. But yo, what's up? Yeah, something like that. But pe <laughs> people, <laughs> just so you can envision it, Frank. Yeah, but, you know, people went crazy after I came to Christ. And I was still young. I was just before I turned 16. I had my artist-producer contract signed. My producers produced some of the top artists in the industry. Um, if you remember that song, uh, This Is How We Do It by Montel Jordan, my sure. producers had written that song. And so I was 15, I was on my way to the big time. And when I came to Christ, uh, I immediately dropped it because I knew I couldn't be a hypocrite and be one thing on stage and another off. You know? And that's why I was fascinated to hear you say that they talked about you being a Christian on the air. You weren't hiding it. You weren't, you know, this is who you were. Uh, but, but when I walked away from it, People couldn't believe it. I'd have people saying to me, man, couldn't you just hung in there and just made your money and gotten famous and then pulled out? And why would you give that up? But why don't you speak to those people who, who, who can't fathom why anyone would do that and how so much more valuable Christ is than any of that uh, stuff that, that Paul called rubbish. Well, I'll respond in two ways. Uh, Tom Jones, the Welch singer that was popular in the 60s and 70s, was on the show before I came to Christ. Right. And uh, the, the stereotypical question would be, how much are you worth? Mm -hmm. He said uh, something like $500 million. Wow. And there was a collective groan in the room, me included. I, I did not know the Lord, and I just was jealous, envious. What would I do with that kind of money? My life would be so much better. And then a handful of years later, um, I came to Christ, and we had a popular lead singer of a major, huge rock and roll band. I won't name him. He carried a big, big gold bag, and he dumped out his bag on the counter, 
gold bars, mm. currency, <laughs> jewels, diamonds, and he was just raving about how much he was worth. And my heart just wanted to break. Mm. Wow. Because I recognized not only the change in me, going from envious jealousy to just compassion and sadness for this man. Um, and then I thought, goodness gracious, that's the world. Yeah. And I yeah. still have so much sensitivity, awareness, recollection. I mean, I taught New Age principles for 25 years. And so what do we tell the world? Well, we live by example. Um, and yeah, was there any part of me that wanted that life? Honestly, no. Mm -hmm. After wow. I came to Christ, you know, this is not the world that we're called to live in. And I, it was almost as if I just saw things differently. You know, mm -hmm. you're born anew, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, my old way was dead. I want no part of celebrity, popularity, and yet in L.A., uh, we're one of the center points. Mm. So I've still met many more celebrities on my new show mm. and have shared the gospel with them. And I think we're all hungry, whether we know God or not. Yeah. Right. God's written eternity on our hearts. Yep. You know, uh, well, after I came to Christ, some good friends of mine and I would get together sometimes, and we would throw out scenarios like... What if someone pulled up with a, a big U-Haul truck full of cash or, or a big U-Haul truck full of diamonds and they told you, hey, all you got to do is just deny Christ. This is all yours. And I remember there are times we would, we would literally fall on the floor and belly laugh uh, because it was so preposterous to us. You know, I love what Paul said, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so, you know, for those of you out there that are watching, once you taste of him, you come to recognize that this world that's fading uh, is foolishness. And yet, as Frank said earlier, when, when he was in the spot that he was in, he had everything that he wanted in a sense. So it wasn't an issue of, let me come to Jesus to be happy and have That's a good right. life. That's right. You come to Christ because you're an offender of a holy God. You've broken his law. You're deserving of his wrath and judgment. And the fact that you were his enemy and he was willing to come down to this earth and to suffer and die on a cross to bring forgiveness of sin is, is just unimaginable. And so it's our hope that if you've been watching us for quite some time now, that you'd recognize that God calls you to repentance, to recognize your guilt, to recognize His holiness, and how you justly deserve His wrath and judgment, but how in His love and His mercy, He sent His Son to give His life for sinners. And uh, He can set you free. And Frank, I had uh, another question for you. Uh, looking back uh, at having been given a platform within an industry where you were a believer at that time, at least for, for the remaining few years that you're on the air. Is there anything you would do differently uh, looking back on that? Uh, hindsight being 2020, I would probably say no because, um, because I had the Lord and all things are possible through Him. You know, you were talking about just a few moments ago about this idea of all the money in the world and I just want to speak to one thing. If anybody listening right now, watching right now is a non-believer, you may have all the success by society standards, and yet I, I promise you, if you're honest with yourself, you go to bed at night, there's still that part of you that says there's got to be something more than this. I had fame, success, I had all of that, met a lot of famous people, mm. and you're still hungry. And nothing in my life satiated me permanently or even for a period of time. And when I came to Christ and I began to recognize who he was and follow him, the hardest part was surrendering. And I know there's even a lot of Christians that say they follow him and they've not completely surrendered. And I think, you know, that, that's the element that I'm called to share with my listeners, that it's so important to recognize who we are, why we're here, the breath we take is given by him, we're here to give him all the glory. And when you do that, Life takes on a vibrancy and a newness where money is a tool. Yes, you can do a lot of wonderful things in the world, support a lot of wonderful nonprofits, whatever the case is, but it's not the answer. And I, I have no qualms. It's not a belief system. It's a knowing that he is the answer to everything, and he's all that I ever want. And if he chooses to remunerate me with money and cash, and fine. You know, I, lots of people can, can benefit from that, a lot of organizations, but... The world, to the world across is folly, we know that. 
Absolutely. So it's yeah. futility, vanity. When I, before I was a Christian, I grew old prematurely at the age of 22. I was like you. I had a house, car, own business, yeah. everything I wanted, and I thought, what's next? Um, am I going to save money, get buried in a gold coffin? I mean, what's the hmm. point of that? They're just going to dig it up and melt it down sort of thing. Um, but when we speak of Christ being precious to us, it's because not only has he proved his love toward us in dying for our sins, but he is the source of life itself. And that's why he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I've come that you might have life. Uh, I, I, uh, Christ who is our life. And so when you receive Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the source of life. You get sealed by the Holy Spirit, so death has no dominion over you. And that's, that's what is precious to me, knowing him and knowing that the futility that I uh, endured as a happy non-Christian is gone, that waste of time and space and being alive, waiting to die, is gone. I've got everlasting life and there's nothing uh, more precious than that. One more que question, unless easy has got something that's causing heartburn. No, is, no for um, <laughs> If you could interview anyone from the Bible, who would it be? John the Baptist, Jezebel, uh, Judas, Keep going. Uh, Noah, <laughs> Eve. You'd like to smack Eve in the face? No, no, <laughs> no. It would, it, it would be, it would be uh, Paul. Apostle Paul. Yeah, Sa Saul of Tarsus. I used to hang up on Christians on my show. You I did? could not hang up on them fast enough. I, I won't say hated, but I can relate to him in a lot of ways. Wow. And when I was born anew, I mean, I'm hosting for all intents and purposes, the largest Christian talk show in America. Right. I don't want to hang up on Christians anymore. <laughs> I just, I just want to awesome. sing his praises. So uh, it would be Paul. Oh, that's great. Saul of Tarsus and then Paul the Apostle and say, what was the difference? That's right. What was wow. the change? That's Is there right. anything to say? To well, I just want to say, Frank, what a delight it's been to have you on with us uh, and to have gained you not only as a brother in Christ, but as a friend now. And we look forward to our partnership for God's glory. And may the Lord keep using you in great ways to impact the kingdom. So remember to check out Frank on KKLA. That's KKLA.com. Uh, wherever you are in the country, and if you're here in the U.S. or in California, you can listen to him live on the radio. So thanks for joining us. God bless you. Thank you for coming into our comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone and preach the gospel for the glory of God. For questions about the comfort zone with Rick Comfort, or to submit questions for future shows, please email us at email at tczlive.com. That's email at tczlive.com. The Comfort Zone is an outreach of living waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel. in the age of information. Every day, new devices are invented to help us communicate with each other in easier and faster ways. But in spite of all the social networking and all the electronic gadgetry, there's one non-electric method of communication that remains consistent as a highly effective way to communicate the gospel quickly and painlessly. Behold, the gospel track. Now, gospel tracks come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are funny, some are serious. And they range from short and sweet to much more in-depth. And every good track contains two elements, the law and the gospel. Now, the law needs to be in a track in order for the reader to understand why they need a savior, right? Because they've broken God's law. And the gospel needs to be in the track because, well, that's the whole point of a gospel track. The gospel. This is our Curved Illusion gospel track. You can go up to a complete stranger and say, I've got something to show you. Which looks bigger, the blue or the red? And they say, obviously, the blue looks bigger. And you swap them over, and the red becomes bigger. It's not magic, it's an optical illusion. It really is amazing. People love it. You say, hey, make sure you read the message on the back. It's just another creative way to share the gospel.